very good. Okay, so uh, welcome here. Um, so uh, last time we had talked about stocks and flows, you recall, and uh, we'd introduced some some uh, basics of of these building blocks that we use to build uh, system dynamics models. And we noted that system dynamics, in contrast to agent-based modeling, has a quite small modeling vocabulary. That is, we build up the models under a fairly small set of components that are, are hitched together in, in creative ways. Um, so we talked about stocks and flows last time. Um, who could tell me some some components of stocks? What are what are some uh, attributes or properties or characteristics of stocks? Okay. They have to very good. So they don't just jump around. They they change only under the influence of flows. And these flows may nudge them up, may nudge them down over time, um, but that movement is is dictated by the net value of the flow going into them. So if the inflows are greater than the outflows, the stock will do what? It will rise. It will increase. Um, will go up in value. And if the outflow is greater than the inflow, will go down in value. Okay. Um, Stocks maintain the state of a system. They represent accumulations and they capture uh, system state. And we noted that stocks can be measured at a particular instance in time. They start with some initial value and thereafter they're changed only by the flows and, and the sources of delays. They change, but they change. If you look small enough periods of time, they change fairly slowly. Um, and in a stock and flow diagram, they're shown as rectangles. So we Next diagram, stock and flow, and the stocks here are shown as rectangles. Um, notice that we can have stocks of very different sorts of, of things. So here on the on the uh, left hand side, we have um, excuse me here uh, on the right, we have uh, three stocks that represent decompositions of the population into different categories. But um, over here, cumulative illnesses. We're counting up the number of illnesses. We might have a further stock that's the accumulated amount of money spent. Um, uh, by the healthcare system in administering treatment or in providing vaccinations or in uh, undertaking intervention. So we can have stocks that hold different quantities. Um, in, this, in, in this case on the right here, they're dividing up a population. But in general, we can, we can have stocks holding different sorts of things. And they're going to need units that are, are, um, that are consistent with that. Um, so stocks determine the current state of the system. They're central to most, uh, most of this equilibrium, and they lead to inertia. It's inertia. They're, they take time to change. Okay. Um, we talked about flows also, and uh, flows represent the element of the process of changing the stocks. They represent rates of change, and different flows into a stock might represent rates associated with different types of processes. So, for example, if we have a stock of the entire population, what sort of flows might flow into to that stock of the entire population, flowing into it? Flows associated with what sort of process? Births would be one. Well, uh, might be another one. Immigration, Immigration would be another one. Um, so, uh, here we can have different processes contributing different flows. Now, from a classic mathematical standpoint, those would all be different contributions to the derivative of the total population, to the, to the rate of change of the total population. But within a system dynamics model, we break those out into, um, into pieces. We represent them as different flows uh, because they may have different um, uh, formulae behind them and because we wish to think about them at different times, measure them at different times, you know, uh, ask, ask for information about them, graph them out, etc. Um, so we noted that, that in contrast to stocks, uh, which can have a wide variety of units, flows are always measured as something per unit time. We're, 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 
terms of the value of a flow, we're specifying the rate of change or something. So it's if it's flowing into a stock of unit X, its unit will be what? So, so if it's flowing into a stock of people, the unit associated with the flow, let's suppose we're measuring in time and days, what would be the unit associated with the flow? Yeah, persons per day, people per day. Um, it's basically, if, if the stock has a dimension X, keeping track of things of, of, uh, of X type, then um, the, the flows into that stock are always going to have X divided by some time unit as their dimensions. And within Vensim, we're going to specify the, uh, the time unit um, associated with the time unit. Um, now, uh, for those who do a Vensim called up, I'd actually like to suggest that you, you go to Vensim right now, and I'm going to use Vensim PLE. I have a more powerful version available, but I'm going to call that up, and I'll start a new model. So you're not going to get that model there. Um, and you'll notice if, if we go and we call up Vensim and you start a new model, I'll be right with you there, um, uh, we'll have a, um, uh, we can, we can uh, specify right there the unit of the stock. Okay, yeah, I'm going to have to uh, switch over to, um, to displaying Vensim here for that. So pardon me for just a second here. And... Um, I'm going to say stop sharing, and I'm going to try to say share entire desktop. Um, so can you see Vensim on the screen now? Um, you folks who are remote, can you give me any indication? Can you see Vensim, kind of a, black, a blank slate with a thing called model settings there? Okay, good. Good. Okay, so when we do um, request a new model, when we go into Vensim for the first time, or when we do within Vensim file new, um, you'll notice that we're going to be able to specify the units for, for time, the yardstick, as it were, with which we measure time, the, the lapse of time. So we could specify year, we could specify month, we could specify day, and then that's applied across the entire model. So what that's telling us is that our, the units for flows are all going to be measured in something per that, that time unit. Um, so if we chose it as month, there'll be Per, per month. Now I'm switching back to um, to the slideshow here. Can you remote folks see this as well? Can you? Uh, yes, okay, good. Okay. Um, so we talked about flows and here are some flows within the, uh, the model here. Um, so one thing I want to draw attention to, and we'll come back to this point later when we talk about agent-based modeling here. To the degree, ladies and gentlemen, which we're, we're subdividing the population here. We're doing so according to the state of that population. Um, in other words, we're doing so to, to distinguish people according to different states. Within each of these, each of these stocks here, susceptible, infectious, temporarily immune, for example, is going to have a count associated with it. Okay? And, and actually, that count needn't even be an integer. It may be a, a real number. Um, so here we're subdividing the population according to state, to the state that they're in, or their attributes. So if we had, if we want to distinguish men and women according, and, and further distinguish according to infection status, we'd have a stock for susceptible men, another stock for susceptible women, a stock for infectious men, infectious women, etc. So we're dividing up the population according to its characteristics. And that dictates the organization of the model. And for each of those subcategories, say infectious men, we'd record some number of infectious men. Perhaps it's 10,000. Perhaps it's one. Um, we'd record that, that count. So we, we organize the model, as it were, according to characteristics or in aspects of state, their properties. And then we count the number of individuals with that, with that property. We'll come back to this when we talk about agent-based model, where we instead organize our model by individual people, and we record for each of those people their characteristics as the data. Here it's kind of the reverse. We distinguish according to state, and, and we distinguish, uh, and with this, then we have as data the number of people in that state. Okay, so. Um, one of the principles of system dynamics is that 
structure shapes behavior. And this is a rule that applies to agent-based modeling um, as well and other types of dynamic modeling, but it's perhaps most obvious when we're dealing with a simple language of stocks and flows um, because the behavior can be extremely rich coming out of this. And it's built up by the interactions of the um, elements of the structure. And generally speaking, ladies and gentlemen, we, we, we speak about system dynamics and agent-based modeling as well as discrete event modeling being part of the system sciences because the behavior of the whole will be quite different from the behavior of any one component or simply the sum of the behavior of the components. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. It's, it has a distinct behavior at the entire level. You wouldn't have predicted from the behavior of one of those parts in isolation. We can very readily have it. This is particularly, uh, this is notably true, uh, really where this becomes uh, very important is for what are called nonlinear models. Um, and we'll get into what that means at a technical level um, soon enough. But basically, it's going to be models which depend where the transition rates, for example, depend not just on one stock, but the, say the multiplication of, of two stocks, susceptibles times infectives times some constant. Okay? And when we get nonlinearity, we can no longer just decompose um, our input into pieces and figure out its, its sort of response to each of those pieces and put it back together to figure out the entirety of the response. The, the system as a whole is coupled in a way that we can't really predict. We can't really decompose neatly. Okay. Um, okay, so here though, structure shapes behavior. System structure here in system dynamics is defined by these vocabulary we've just learned, stocks and flows and connections between them. There are these things, auxiliary variables, but they really just boil down to nice names for formulas involving stocks and flows. So really system structure is defined by stocks and flows. Feedbacks involve stocks and flows. All feedbacks involve at least one stock and at least one flow. Okay. Um, and some feedbacks involve just the stock and the flow into it, or the flow out of it. For example. Um, when we are in the context of nonlinear, we see this emergent behavior. Um, and uh, stock and flow structure of a system determines the qualitative behavior modes the system can take on. Um, it turns out that when we're working with system dynamics models, that that model will have certain characteristic modes of behaviors. And we can adjust the parameters, the data assumptions, up and down in all sorts of different ways. But we can only get it to elicit behavior within a certain range compatible with its structure. It's like a slinky. How many of you have ever worked with a slinky? However many, uh, how many, many of you have, have enjoyed the acquaintance, the pleasure of the acquaintance with the slinky? So um, how many have let a slinky go down the stairs? Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, now I'm seeing more, more recognition. So a slinky is a kind of, um, it's a kind of coil, um, it's a kind of helix, um, as it were, a, uh, a spiral uh, of metal, or these days plastic. They don't make them like they do when I was young. You know, we, had, <laughs> we had good, strong metal slinkies. They, they're still around, but plastic, I think, has eclipsed them. And um, these slinkies exhibit certain types of behavior, behavior that continues to adult children, and to, to uh, delight children even to this day. Um, and these slinkies, um, when you hold them up, and you let go of one end, what will it do? So if, you, if, I, hold a, if I were to help hold a slinky here, um, and I were to let go of the lower end, what would it do? It would sort of bounce around, right? That's, that's an aspect of its structure. It's an aspect of the fact that it exhibits some elasticity, and you pull on it, and it pulls back, and there's this thing called Hooke's Law, which applies, and all that sort of stuff. And the structure of that slinky um, allows it to exhibit certain types of behavior. Its types of behavior are, are restricted by virtue of its structure. Um, there are certain things that slinky, for all the virtues that recommend it, will never do. It will, you know, it will never uh, fragment into a thousand pieces and then recoalesce or something like that. Its structure keeps it within a certain range of motion. Uh, it, it exhibits certain behavior that's characteristic. And so it is with these models. So we're going to now build a little model in, in Vensim, and we're going to see some of the types of behavior that it elicits. And we're going to go with a very, very simple model at first to develop stock and flow reasoning. And we're going to see how the pieces of the model come together. And then we're going to go to a model which exhibits um, 
some slightly more complex behavior with feedbacks. Okay, so we're gonna assume for the moment that diabetes is not curable and is what we call dichotomous. You either have diabetes or you don't, okay? Um, and those are sort of the two categories that pick up. And so there's gonna be stocks, people with diabetes and people without diabetes, okay? Um, and we can elaborate this, of course. We can have different stages of risk, pre-diabetes, um, individuals who are who exhibit risk factors like obesity for diabetes, et cetera. But here we're just gonna have two stocks. And we're gonna have uh, uh, flows. Um, so there's going to be incident cases, which are gonna be people going from without diabetes state to with diabetes. And then there's gonna be deaths from both of the stocks. So it's gonna look something like this, okay? So let's build this up within Benson, okay? Um, so I'm gonna go here um, to, um, to Benson. And we're going to build this structure. So how, how do we do this? Well, we, we go up here and there's a palette and there's a thing called box variable. Again, it could be called level, it could be called a stock. You'll notice it says level after it. And basically you click on that and then you can click down here and you can click uh, people or type people without diabetes, okay? Um, and then you can drag it if you want to make it less, uh, less crowded. And then we'll click over here. You notice I'm still in this mode where I'm putting down those variables. People with diabetes, and let me drag this down some and, and drag this like that. And then, um, so, so in a short, I went into this mode and I clicked and I got one and I typed in the name and um, I clicked and I got the other, okay? And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to do, I'm gonna, do what's called this rate or flow, and I'm gonna click on one and then click on the one to which it, the one from which it comes and then to the one to which it goes. So I'm gonna say um, incident cases of diabetes, okay, something like that. So with that with that flow mode, do I want to save the back save a backup? No. Um, so uh, this rate, you click on one, the one from which it comes, the one to which it goes. And now we're gonna add the death transition. So, so for, for this one on the left, we're gonna do, we're gonna have a, a certain process associated with death of people without diabetes. Um, and over here, we're gonna have uh, death of people with diabetes, okay? Um, so we should have a model that looks something, something like um, you'll notice if any of you are having trouble, you did something you didn't mean to do, there's this, there's this guy here. Now, what is that guy's name? That's a Pac-Man, indeed. Um, it could be a Ms. Pac-Man, but um, that, is, that is an obvious from the coloration um, in silhouette. Um, so, so this is a Pac-Man, and, and this Pac-Man, um, uh, despite its appearance, it can be your friend, it can also be your enemy. Um, be your enemy by eating up parts of the model you didn't mean to click on, but it can be your friend. If you click on it, you'll get into a mode where you can click on things and they'll be destroyed, removed from your model. So that's that's how you can clean up your model, okay? Um, okay, so we have this model like this. Now, this model is a stock and flow structure. It exhibits stock and flow structure, but it doesn't yet have dynamics associated with it. To get it to the point where there's some dynamics, what do we have to do? This is a nice stock to flow structure. It gives it a high level and understanding of what's going on. We know what the stocks are, what the flows are. We know something about how stocks are related to flows. And that gives us some, some insights into how it might behave. But what must we do to turn this into a simulatable model? OK, yeah, we have to put in some starting values. How many people do we start with diabetes? Because Remember, stocks, their future evolution is dictated by flows. But they have to start with some initial state. After that, it's dictated by flows. But they have to start with some, somewhere. Um, and then we're going to have to specify some formulae for these, for these flows. So what would I like you to do for that? Well, it's written up here. I'd like you to use an initial value of 1,000 for this guy. And for these flows, I'm going to ask you to do the simplest possible thing. Um, I'm just going to put in constants, OK? Now this is not good practice. I do not recommend that you build models where you just stick constants in like this willy-nilly. 
It's best to create parameters which can then be changed and, and modified uh, even graphically in Venison using what's called synthesim. But for now, we're going to stick in some, some constants uh, for, for these flows. So for these, um, for these stocks, what you're going to do is you're going to go into this thing called equation mode. Um, and uh, once you're in that mode, you can click on a stock. And you'll notice the basic formula is given. It's just the integral of these two things. So so flow out minus flow out. So it, it's just integrating up over time, you know, the negative of each of these flows. But it has some initial value, and I'd like you to specify a thousand for that. Okay, there's some initial value for that, and some initial value indeed over for people with diabetes. I'd like you to say a thousand for that. Okay, um, uh, that's that's fine. Um, uh, you can experiment on your own with with different numbers. Death of people without diabetes just enters zero. Death of people with diabetes. These are flow. These are formulae for flows. So they could depend on stocks. They could depend on other flows, which would ultimately depend on stocks uh, or constants. But death of people with diabetes, we're going to enter ten. So, so what does that mean? Ten. What does it mean that I'm specifying it for a flow? This means ten per. And what is the, the per up here? Well, we'd have to go, we could do, excuse me, model settings. It was specified initially. Do I want to save it? No. Settings, and it's per month. OK, fine. Make it per month. Um, uh, I think that's the default anyway. OK. Um, so, so again, I did 10 here. I did 0 for this guy. And for incident case of diabetes, just put down 15 right now. OK. So uh, to get to those, I go into this mode up here. So it's, it's this, it says y equals x squared. OK, so. so OK, OK. Um, oh, look at that. Oh, this is the new version. OK, OK. Um, so you have a trash can. OK, they, um, that's your pack man. Um, so what you want is equations. This guy here. So, uh, sorry, there's a thing that says, sorry folks, I, I should have updated my, I guess they went through a big change. It's a, it says f of x for where it used to say y equals x squared. This is the equation, okay? Um, up, up here, it, it says f of x. Instead of the Pac-Man, Pac-Man has been replaced unceremoniously <laughs> by, a, by a track. Um, so uh, there's a, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's an Oscar. Um, that's right. Um, and uh, that replaces the, the um the, the pack me. Um so uh so your 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 top will look a little bit different from the newest version of that. Oh sure, sure, sure. So for um it, it's probably simple if, if I do this. So a thousand for each of these guys, for each of these stocks. And and for this flow from people without diabetes, it's zero. For this flow from people with diabetes, it's ten. And for this flow between the two, it's fifteen. Okay. Okay, that's a that's the biggest change I've seen in Vensim in ten years. <laughs> and it had to happen. Okay, I'll, I'll get the new version. Um, thanks for pointing that out. That's really helpful. Okay, so do people get these? You okay with that? Okay. Um, okay, so what I'd like to do now is, now that we've done that, you can run it. And on my model, there's there's a running guide. Let's go see. In my, my version, there's a running guide. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, the, the run. Where, uh, it's, it's, this, it's this little um, go button. It looks like a green button, green, green triangle on the upper right. Um, it's, uh, it replaces, oh gosh, I'm going to have to draw a running man now. Um, replaces a guy who looks, looks kind of like, uh, yeah, yeah, it looks like this. Um, okay, so, so there's now a, um, there's now a, a button up, up here that's, that's like run or, 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 or simulate, something like that. Okay, can people simulate this? So I'm going to run it here. 
and it'll say, do I want to save it? No. Uh, data set current, yeah, it already exists. Okay, fine. So I just ran it. Uh, um, now, what happened? Well, to see what happened, is anyone having trouble running it? No. Okay, well, it will just, it will, it, it, because it will confine you if oh. you do it. Okay, and so um, what I'd like you to do now is to go double click on p persons with diabetes and go click on, click on the graph over. So who can explain what's going on here? Okay, and why is it increasing? Because the, the flow in is greater than the flow out. Okay, uh, so that's that's good. Um, okay, um, what do you think uh, people without diabetes is doing? It's, let's go look at this. So it started at 1,000, but figure out what it's going to do after that, that's its initial value, to figure out what it's going to do after that, we have to look at the what, the flows, and it, so what's it going to do? It's, it's going down because it's a net outflow, there's no inflows and there's only outflows and one of the outflows is greater than zero, so it's going to be going down over time, and um, in fact it is, it's, it's going down like that. Okay, so, so that's all well and good. Um, um, so, so let me ask this now. Um, I'm not going to ask you to do it. There is a way to do that with Venzum interactively. There's a way to do it with formulas. But suppose we were to lower um, the incidence of case of diabetes from 15 to 5 at some point, say at, at after 75 months. We're to lower this from 15 to 5. What would that mean to the number of people with diabetes? If we lowered the number of the rate at which people are getting diabetes from 15 people per month to 5 people per month, what, what's going to happen to the number of people with diabetes then? Okay, the slope will change. That's definitely the case. And more, it will decrease. So why will it decrease? Because this is now 5. The net flow, yeah, we have 10 going out, 5 in per month. 10 going out per month, 5 coming in per month. And therefore, just as if the drain in your bathtub was squirting out water faster than you were getting it in, it's going to be going down, right? And so, indeed, uh, if you had the flow, the, the, the incident cases, here shown here in red, go from 15 to 5, while the deaths of people with diabetes was constant, this would rise, the, the total number of people with diabetes would rise and then it would start to decline, like that, in a linear fashion. Sure. Sure. Okay, so I was, I was to, to develop sort of reasoning about the process of accumulation here, I was saying suppose right now we have people with diabetes rising. And it's rising because we have a net inflow into it. Um, because we have 15 people per month coming in normally and via this, and then 10 people per month leaving via this outflow, right? And so people with diabetes is gonna be rising at how many people per month? Five people per month net, right? That's why it was rising. But I was saying that if at some point incident cases of diabetes were to go down from 15 people per month to five people per month, what would then happen in terms of the dynamics of people with diabetes? And the point was, it would no longer just rise linearly, it would go up, and then at that point that transition occurred, it would go down, okay? So it would start to decline. So the value, the shape etched by this stock is, a, is dictated by the rates of flow into and out of it. And this is going to get us to our next discussion here where we start talking about incorporating feedback signals. Because here we have, you know, a, uh, a quite simple dynamics associated with the stock. But once the flows start to depend on other stocks, which they don't right now, we can start to see more and more complex dynamics associated with the stocks. Does that answer your question, though? Yeah, okay. Um, Okay, so, so let's, let me ask this. So suppose now we had um, diabetes flows like this. So incident cases of diabetes, suppose the red here. Suppose that were as shown and, and uh, deaths of people with diabetes 
So incident case of diabetes, um, this red, started at 100 people per month and then sort of rose like that. But deaths of people with diabetes started at about 125 per month and just went, went flat, straight. So what, would, what, what happens now to the stock of people with diabetes? Can anyone describe how it would change? Okay, and why is it decreasing? Because the net flow is negative, because this blue is greater than the red, right? And then what's it going to be doing? What's it going to be doing at this point? No change, because inflow equals outflow. And, and what's it going to be doing after that? Okay. Now, let me ask this. Where will it reach its maximum? At what time will that stock reach its maximum value? Good. Good. A lot of people out there who look at this and they'll say it reaches its maximum at time 75. Yes. So at time 75 is when it's increasing the fastest, right? But it reaches its maximum at 125 because all during this period here, this entire period, the what? The it is doing what? During this entire time period, from here to here, the stock is increasing because the inflow is greater than the outflow, right? So it's going to be, it's going to be uh, at its maximum here. What's it going to, what's it, is it going to be going up or down here? Trick question. It's going to be oh, going up or down. At, it, it's not doing either. It's staying flat because inflow equals outflow. And then down here, it's going to be doing what? Out here. Out here, it's going to be and decreasing with increasing, well, <laughs> decreasing, yeah, <laughs> decreasing uh, ever faster. Um, <laughs> okay, so when, it, when it is at its lowest point, when it's at its highest point, um, you can figure these out, but it takes a bit of thinking about the accumulation going on, right? This is really what's going on here. Um, so we had it going down, it reached, it plateaued right, right under that point where they crossed, then it went up, plateaued here, again, at highest value, and then it goes, it goes down. Okay, um, so stocks are changed by flows, and we've used constant values for flows. But in general, the formula, question? No? Okay, in general, the formulas for the flows will depend on things that are changing. Ladies and gentlemen, with this model we've just put in here, um, it has some virtues to recommend it, but here we have um, we have values for uh, the flows which are which are fixed, and in general, the values of those flows will depend on things that are changing on state, um, and these things ultimately change based on either constants or the current state, as dictated by what? What is the current state? It's it's dictated by the values of the, what is it that keeps the state in a system dynamics model? What is it that summarizes the current state of the system? The stocks. So ultimately the flows have to depend on either constants or, or stocks or, you know, some predefined sort of, you could say, okay, this flow should go at this, w at this predefined way, but either depends on that or, or on stocks, okay? Um, it can depend on other flows, but those depend on the stocks. So um, let me ask this. I mean, we look at our model here. What's the matter with this as a model? Why, why not just put in deaths of people without diabetes to be 10 per month? Suppose, suppose we have some historic data, you know, for, for the past uh, however long in our patient population we've had, we've had uh, 10 people with diabetes dying per month. Why not just put that in for that? Why could that cause a problem? if we are examining how things change going forward. Why not just hard code that? 10 people per month die from diabetes. That's what the historic data says. Yeah. Because that, that's, that's right. So well, what, what Dylan was commenting there is it, I mean, you could hard code those in because they're dictated by, you know, according to history, but things may change, right? past results are not necessarily indicative of future performance. Um, so, so, you know, if, if you had a larger population with diabetes, 
that rate at which the, the sort of number of people dying per month may well be different. If you had a million people with diabetes, um, uh, you're going to have a lot more people leaving than, than when you have 100,000. Or let me put it this way, even more starkly. If you have zero people with diabetes, is it plausible to think there'll still be 20 people per month dying of diabetes with diabetes? No, not at all, not at all. So, so folks, I mean, particularly when you think about the exhaustion of a stock, the fact that stocks may go to zero, there may be nothing left to drain, the flows out need to depend in some way on the, thing, on the, on the value of that stock. They can't just be some fixed flow unless you're willing to see it go negative. So, so, you know, in this case, we have a kind of implausible situation where we've, we've hard-coded the values, we've seen some dynamics, but, but really to be more true to the situation, to capture the fact that we're talking about, you know, some number of, of uh, some physical quantities which can be exhausted, we need to have the flows depend on the stocks. And fortunately, that's, uh, that's very easy to do. Oh, look at that. Um, okay, so, um, Let's let's go um, let's go take a look at this. Now I have a little example here, but um, let's instead do this. Just I'm going to add lib here, um, as I am wont. Um, so what I'd like to do now is to um, go within this model, and I'd like to add in a uh, to to sort of make this a little bit more rich. Okay. I'd like to add in a variable, um, and this is going to be a constant or, or auxiliary. Um, and we're going to add it in, and it's going to be um, diabetic mortality rate, okay? So that's going to be the mortality rate for diabetics. That's going to be their chance per month that they die from diabetes. What, per month? Because they're coming into this month. Okay. Um, so do you folks have a, have a variable like that in your, in your thing? Okay, so diabetic mortality rate. And now I'm going to start to, I'm going to make death of people with diabetes depend on this. So how do we do that? Well, we have to go add in from these arrows up here. We have to add in a link from the thing it depends on to the thing which depends on it. That is the type of English up with which I will not put. Um, so we need to add an arrow that goes from the variable um, on which the formula will depend to the variable uh, associated with that. Um, the Queen's English serves me well. Um, so uh, I've just added added that, and I'm going to add. We don't have to bend it like that, um, but I can similarly add one from here to here. Um, so I'm going to have a formula which now depends for the deaths of people with diabetes, which depends on the people number of people with diabetes and the diabetic mortality rate. And I've added those arrows to show that this formula depends on each of them. And it's simultaneously both a reminder and a convenience because if we go into equation mode, that f of x mode again, it will show us what things need to be filled in. And if we click on this, it will now prompt us, okay, these are the two things we've told that it might depend on. And I'm going to have the formula. Well, what do you think, folks, if we're talking about, if we have a chance per month of, a, of someone who is diabetic, And then we have a number of people with diabetes. Can someone give me a formula for the number of the average number of people dying from diabetes per month based on these two, two things? So if we have a diabetic mortality rate, a per month mortality rate, and people with a number of people with diabetes, how many people per month on average will be dying of diabetes? It would be the product of the two, right? So if you have a if you have a one percent chance and, and it's not not like this, but if you had a 1% chance per month of dying from, from diabetes and there's 100 people with diabetes, or say 10,000 people with diabetes, on average 10,000 over 100 or 100 people per month will be dying from diabetes. Does that make sense? No? Okay. So, so what we're going to put in here is diabetic mortality rate times people with diabetes. So this is what I told you about when I said that Benson is, it's declarative. I mean, we put in these formulas. We're going to give it a formula for this, and it's going to use that. And in some ways, it's like specifying a formula in a spreadsheet. The deal, ladies and gentlemen, 
This is a this is a deep point which you could muse on if you feel so inclined to, uh, preferably outside of class. But um, uh, it's kind of like the spreadsheet in that you specify these formulas and it handles all the calculations behind the scene transparently. Very nice, very attractive. It's kind of like the reverse of a spreadsheet, though, in the sense that, ladies and gentlemen, a spreadsheet shows the numbers and hides the structure. This model uh, shows the structure and it gives you recourse to the numbers, but it doesn't show them automatically. Okay, so it's kind of like the reverse the reverse of it, a spreadsheet turned on its head. But you say, okay there, and it now has that formula. And then for diabetic mortality rate, let's, let's make it say 1%, so 0 0.01. So how did I do this? Well, I'm still in equation mode. I clicked here, I did diabetic mortality times people with diabetes, and then diabetic mortality rate, I just clicked on and I specified it directly, okay? Any questions about that? Okay, okay, so, so now if we were to run this model, what do you think would happen? So if, if we were to run this, and we, uh, suppose we, it's, oh, up here you can name this run, and it will save away the results of the runs and let you compare them. So instead of saying current, up, does yours say current up here? Yeah? yeah. Okay. Um, uh, make it, um, you know, current uh, with, um, with, uh, with feedback. We've just introduced our first feedback. Do I want to save it? No. Um, why do I say there's a feedback here? I just said there's a feedback. Why is there feedback? Why do I say that that's a feedback? I mean, it looks, it looks very unassuming, but why is it, where is there a feedback here? What sort of feedback is it? It's a negative feedback. It's, in other words, it's a balancing feedback. It lends itself towards stability. And left to its own, without these other parts of the model, left to its own, this structure here would lead to what? It would gravitate towards what point? What, what stability is it seeking? It's, it's trying to move towards a situation where there's actually no, no diabetics, actually. It, so the more. So where's the feedback? Let's trace this through. If you were to increase people with diabetes, how does that lead to a feedback? If you were to add another 100 people to the number of people with diabetes, that will lead to what? Causally, that will lead to more deaths per month of people with diabetes, which will push back against that original chain. Adding to the number of people with diabetes will lead to more deaths per month, which will, which will sort of push back against any original change you made. So over time, you may have added 100 people, but in both cases, the difference between with and without those 100 will become smaller and smaller and smaller. Sort of uh, that change will be uh, less, less and less pronounced between that and what would have happened otherwise. So I'm going to click here. And you'll notice, actually, in mine, the um, the, the behavior is, is shown on this. But if we could click on this, we could see, okay, people with diabetes is exhibiting different behavior for these two scenarios. The original one is shown in red, and that just increased straight. Current with feedback, it increases, but it increases at a slower rate. Why do we see this going up more slowly? So in other words, why is the number of people with diabetes, as shown in blue, when we add that death feedback, why is that going up more slowly than the original one? That's right, exactly. So to see that, we can go click on this deaths of people with diabetes, go double click on that and display, and this is what we saw, this is what we see. So what is the red here? That's, why is that straight? Why is that, that was, fixed at 10 people per month before. And now, it starts at 10 people per month, but it's, that's because it's 1,000 times 0.01, right? Um, that, that chance, that mortality, but this is gonna rise, it's gonna rise in this fashion. Now, it's, it's rising, the number of death, the rate of death of people with diabetes, number of people per month dying with diabetes is rising here. Is it rising linearly? 
No. It's rising in this kind of gradual way. And actually, it's going to go, given that we have, given that we have some number of people coming in here, this is actually going to go to a stable point eventually. Let me, let me muse about that. Um, so, so this people with diabetes, so let's be clear here, because there's a feedback, the flow depends on the stock, right? We, we put in that formula, right? It depends on the stock. Does the stock depend on the flow? The value of the stock depend on the flow? Yeah, it's dictated by this flow and, and the flow in. So it sure depends on it. So there's this kind of mutual dependency between them. And they're eliciting this behavior. Now, if I ran this out far enough, and you folks are welcome to this or not, if you go up to model, you go to settings, I think it's still under that, and you go final time, say, 1,000. Ooh, we'll run out of 1,000 months. And then we were to run this thing again. Um, yes. Now what we see is something like this. Why is this balancing out? Why is that evening out? Why, is, why doesn't this just go up without limit? Let me ask this, before we put that feedback in, this, that's shown in red, we only ran it up to 100, so it only goes up to 100, but what would it have done? Would it have risen, would it have plateaued out? No, why not? There's, yeah, there's a constant. We have 15 people per month coming in, 10 people per month dying, so it's gonna be going up by five people per month. That's it, right? Okay, did we dictate that here? Exactly. Exa and that was exact and that was my point before that that this assumption of fixed rates, um, they didn't impose anything about this. So here we have negative people. And you know, um, generally I like to be around positive people. Um, <laughs> It's going to be a real drag. And, and it's a drag in the model, too, when you start to have negative people around. Um, it's a sign that your model's not consistent. Um, we, we put something in that's, that's quite inconsistent. But here, um, it's still, we, still have negative, <laughs> we still have negative people, actually, and the people with diabetes, because we, ha we haven't turned that into a, a flow. What, what would it take? But, but I want to focus on this thing for a second. Why does this plateau? Why does people with diabetes plateau? What, let's ask this from earlier. Under what conditions is the stock value going to be constant? Under what conditions will it no longer be changing? Under what conditions will it be going up, neither, neither up nor down? Inflow equals, equals outflow. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, this must be in a situation where the inflow equals outflow. What is the inflow based on, on what we did earlier? What, what was the inflow? Well, we haven't changed that, right? It's 15. So, so in that ultimate situation, what must this be? It must be 15. Okay. And so this formula must, be, must give a value of 15. If the diabetic mortality rate is 0.01, under what conditions would that flow be 15? If if there's 1,500 people with diabetes, then this outflow will equal the inflow, right? And that will be in balance. And indeed, it goes to 1,500. That's why. Okay. Okay. So that's good enough. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we could go stick in other um, uh, things like this. So, so if we want to fix this from going negative, what what would we have to do? I mean, right now, these flows. Well, why is this going negative? Anyone say? I mean, what would we have to do to make this not go negative? Okay, so we don't like the fact that it's going negative. What, what must we do to fix that? Okay, we, we could maybe have bursts coming in, but that would kind of be patching over the issue. Um, <laughs> okay, so there's sort of a bound, but that's, that is, I want to generalize that a bit. In some way, these flows have to depend on this value. They can't be independent. You can't say 15 people will get diabetes regardless of whether there's people around to get it. That, you know, magically, the, these people will come out of nowhere. Um, 
uh, or the 15, the, the zero people, well, you could say zero people die if there's not, you know, to die. That's fine. But, but here, in some cases of diabetes, you've got to, got to depend in some way. Sorry? You could put a minimum. Yeah, yeah. You, you, um, for some simulation uh, packages, you can, you can impose a minimum. But that's, you could actually do that by just making this formula turn off the state when it reaches zero. That's another way to do it. Okay, so, so incident case of diabetes, let's, let's impose uh, what Riley said earlier, an incidence rate. There's a certain chance per month that you'll become diabetic. Okay. Um, now, um, we can go impose this. Personally, I find it easier to think about chances per year because that's a normal but if we had a chance per year, we could actually turn it into a chance per month. So it's not that, that big a thing. But here will be uh, diabetes uh, incidence rate. So say um, we have a chance per month of becoming diabetic. Suppose we make it 0 0.02, okay, 2% 2 chance. And we'll connect that up with incident case of diabetes. So incident case of diabetes will now depend on, what else will it depend on? What's the whole point? This is now going to depend on, in some cases, the number of people getting diabetes needs to depend on what? The, the people without diabetes. Yeah, exactly. Um, so these are the sort of the rate at which people are getting diabetes. And if there ain't no people without diabetes, um, there's going to be no one getting diabetes. So what's the formula here going to be? Give me, give me a formula. So if I, if I have a one, a two percent chance month that I'm going to get diabetes, and there's this many people at risk of diabetes, on average, how many people are going to get it per month? Suppose there was a 10% chance per month that each person in this room was going to get, get a, you know, catch flu, suppose. Um, and there's ten, suppose there's 10 of us in the room, on average, how many people per month will get flu? One person per month. Okay. Um, so, what do we got to do with these two? We got to multiply. Yeah, it's the same basic uh, idea there. And um, and so then, you know, we could we could uh, run this, you know, um, you know, and uh, incidence um, feedback. We could we could call it there. Okay. So now now we're seeing somewhat more complex behavior. Um, so, so what do people think is going to happen now? So, so now we've added a, a feedback here that it depends on this. So what do you think is going to happen differently from before? Are, are there going to be negative people? Remind you, uh, just, uh, put, put aside, this is zero here, uh, the deaths. We, we've left that as zero. So I, I think, is it zero? Did, do we make it zero? Or do we make it ten? Um, let me go check. Zero. Yeah. So, so w we can put that aside for the minute. If you know, we if it were non-zero, we'd have to worry about doing the same thing for that. But here we have incident cases of diabetes being some incidence rate times people with diabetes. And so, what do you think is going to happen with uh, people without diabetes? Okay. Yeah, it's going to go to zero. Now you'll notice it's displaying both of these. It's displaying all the so-called loaded runs. Um, uh, and in other words, all the runs we've done. If we want to unload some, there's, there should be a little thing called control panel up there, and you can go to data sets, and you can knock some of them out. So you could just see, um, just see, you know, uh, just see a subset of them. In this case, maybe we only want to look at the current one. So this is what we're seeing now. Hmm? People without diabetes. Wow. What is Let's go check people with diabetes. What do, you, what do you think, given that this is what's going on with people without diabetes, what do you think people with diabetes, what do you think they're going to look like? Are they going to be going up over time in a straight way? Okay. Are they, so before they were going up and plateauing, right? And now they're going to be doing what? By the way, I, I did this model settings to a time a thousand and I've kept that. so. Maybe I should have been more careful because now I'm running up. So this is what we see ultimately. What's, what's going on? Why, why does this look so different?
yeah, uh, well, well spoken. Um, well spoken. Um, so I won't, uh, I won't repeat the um, entirety of that, uh, that exposition to those online. But uh, suffice it to say that what happens is that, that um, initially we have uh, people coming in with incident cases of diabetes at quite a high rate. Um, and, and they're coming in at 20 people per month uh, initially, right? Where did that 20 come from? Why 20 people per month initially? Where did that come from? What? Yeah, yeah. So the incident rate is 2% per month, and there's 1,000 people without it. So, so that's going to give 20 per month on average coming in. Um, and, and that's going to be higher than the, uh, than the outflow um, initially, which is uh, down towards 10. And so on a, net, on a net basis, the number of people with diabetes is going to go up initially. But then it's going to level off. And it's going to level off because this is increasing here. You know, there's more people at risk. And so the rate at which people are leaving is going to be higher. And the number of incident cases of diabetes is going to be getting lower because of what? Why is this going down? Why is incident cases of diabetes going down? There's fewer people at risk anymore. Um, there's fewer people at risk, so this is going to be going down. So eventually these two will, will match each other, so this is going to be flat, because this one was rising as the number of people with diabetes rose. This one was going down as the incident case of diabetes. So at some point they're going to cross, and then this guy is going to be, whoa, whoa. Um, it's going to be flat, and then it's going to start to decline. And during all through this period, this stock is declining because of what? Dylan emphasized it before, um, before the apocalypse happened. Um, so this is declining. And why is it declining? The only reason it, it, a stock's going to be declining is if the outflow is greater than the inflow. The rate of outflow is greater than the rate of inflow. So if deaths are occurring faster in some cases of diabetes. And that's occurring because there's fewer and fewer people still to get diabetes. and and uh, people are dying off, and so eventually this, this goes down to zero. It's basically the entire population has, has developed diabetes and, and subsequently died. Okay. So that, that's what's going on. Um, uh, that, that sounds dispiriting. Um, I should have come up with a better example. Maybe that should have been graduation, and, you know, <laughs> finding a job or something like that. Um, anyway, um, moving right along. Um, okay, so what we've just seen is, is, is an example of what's called first order delays. Okay? Um, this, this whole thing where you have a stock and you have a certain chance per unit time of leaving it, that's called a first order delay. A fixed chance per unit time of leaving. It's called a first order delay. Okay? Um, and it, it turns out it's a deterministic approximation to a population which is where each person is sort of Poisson, um, uh, it, it, each person has a certain chance per unit time of, of leaving in a, in, a, um, uh, in a stochastic uh, fashion. The system is memoryless because the chance of, for example, a person leaving in the next unit of time is independent of how long they've been there. Let me state that again. It's memoryless. Their chance of leaving in the next month is the same regardless of how long they've been there. What is their chance of leaving, ladies and gentlemen, from this stock here, people with diabetes? What's their chance of leaving from this stock right now? Yeah, 0.02. It's dictated by this incident right up here. So does that depend on how long they've been in this stock? No. No. At some point they'll leave, but no matter how long, if, if they still haven't left there for one, Two months, three months. They still have that same chance of leaving. So they have the same chance to kick at the can every month, but but there's fewer and fewer of them that, that remain because many of them have, have, have left uh, earlier. And here we have their time within this state being distributed exponentially. Um, so there's uh, they're leaving in a Poisson-like manner, and the time in, in, within the state is, is exponentially distributed. Some leave early, some leave late. On average, ladies and gentlemen, 
and I prove it later in, this, in, in these slides, although I won't present it. The average time they spend there is one over their chance per unit time of leaving. So the average amount of time they spend here is one over this, in this case, this incident. Right? That's going to be one over 0.02, which is going to be 50 months. is the average amount of time someone stays in this stock, people without diabetes, before going on people with diabetes. By the same token, people remain in this people with diabetes stock for an average of 1 over 0.01, that is, is diabetic, 1 over the diabetic mortality rate, months before leaving. Okay? Okay, so that's, that's what's called a first order, a first order delay. Okay? Um, and uh, I have some, uh, I have some comments on, um, on this uh, from a mathematical perspective that we don't have time to, to talk about here. But anyone who's interested um, can look, and I, I talk about how it depends on the time step of this model. It turns out this model is simulated on a time step by time step basis, okay? So it's simulated by sort of I mean, each successive time step, how many people leave, updating the number of people still in that stock, you know, having people go, et cetera. And you can go, you know, with a coarser time step, say a time step of one, and it will figure out, okay, here, you know, there's a, a change in the stock. Um, so if the, uh, the chance per unit time of leaving, say, is 0 0.2, there's the value of the flow is going to be um, 1,000 times 0 0.2, which is minus 200. This is a different example. And then it will be updated, okay, that stock will now have a value of 800, and it figures out what the flow is the next time from that, et cetera. But Generally, the, the finer and finer you get with your time step, the more exact it's going to be. So, so you could do the same computation with different, different time steps, and you get slightly different results in terms of the number of people, uh, uh, people leaving. And in Vensim, if you go up to the settings area, there's a thing that says time step there, and that will say how finely you step it. There's a further issue of, of using what's called the, the integration, the numerical integration from routine, whether it's Runga, Cutter, Euler. Here we're making a simple assumption of what's called Euler integration. You can also set the initial time and the final time. It's technical stuff I don't expect you to know in detail, but you can get slight differences. Um, and generally, it's going to converge to, to a, an exact solution, um, the smaller and smaller the time step. Okay. So I do a, a computation here where um, I express this as a, really what's going on from a differential equation perspective. If, if we have you know, a uh, stock X and we have a certain chance per unit time of leaving it, alpha, the rate of change, the number of people leaving per month on average is gonna be minus, or it's, it's gonna be alpha times X, the rate of change. It's gonna be minus because they're leaving the stock. And this leads to a, an exponential decay, uh, a decay of, of exactly this sort, um, which uh, is, is why this is declining, um, this is declining exponentially. This is an example of that exponential decay here. Um, it starts high and it declines exponentially. And the formula for this would be E would be a thousand times e to the minus 0 0.02 times t, or t is the time measured in months in this case. So this is this is uh, associated with a with an exponential decline. Okay. So I, I derive here the sort of mean time to leave the transition, etc. For anyone uh, who's interested. Um, okay. Now, in some cases, we can have what are called competing risks. Um, so. Uh, we could have some people, and for example, there may be a chance of developing end-stage renal disease or diabetes on the one hand, a chance of death on the other. In this case, you're subject to both of those chances, and there might be a probability for each of them. So an annualized death rate, say for beta, and annualized diabetes rate if, we, if our time unit is years. And people would, would die with each of the, with this rate and, and go on to develop diabetes with, with this rate, okay? Um, and I do some, some uh, demonstrations there. Okay, so first order delays are the most common structure you will see in system dynamics models. Um, you'll see them throughout many, many models. This is an example of them here. Um, temporarily immune people, number of uh, newly susceptible, 
when there's an immunity loss delay. So folks, let me ask you to state back to, to me something that's very important but I glossed over quickly there. So if, if I have an average amount of time, so let me, mm, uh, let me think how to present this best. So I can either express a first order delay. This is maybe the, a good way to go about it. I can either express a first order delay as the number of people in this thought times some chance per unit time of leaving, say 1% chance per year of death, something like that, times the number of people in the population. Or I can express it as a that same number of people divided by the average time until that event occurs. Okay? So the average lifespan. You could express it either way. The average lifespan here would be one over the chance per year of leaving. Okay. Um, so you could express it either way. In this case, it's expressed as T divided by the immunity loss delay. So with a first order delay, if you have that stock in, in flow in that fashion, it turns out that the average amount of time in the stock is one over that chance per unit time you'll leave the stock. That's just a mathematical property that's proven in the calculus if you want to go back and look at it. Um, so I, I derive that fact. Um, and that's a very convenient fact because we can sometimes we'll want to specify a formula as T times some chance per unit time, say chance per year of this. Sometimes we want to express it as T divided by the mean time in T, and we'll know that. And if we express it as a first order delay, we can express it either way. So, so those are first order delays, and you'll see them throughout uh, throughout the models, uh, system dynamics models. We'll see. Okay. Um, so, so here, if we um, if we had, for example, people with virulent infection uh, who are going to die, and there's a per month likelihood of death, and suppose we had a value of 0.2 for this, what would be the average number of months that they would live with the virulent infection before dying? Your chance per month is 0.2. What's the average number of months you'll die? You'll live with that infection before dying. In other words, before leaving the stock. If this is 0.2, how many months will you live before going down here? There is an integral, and you can find the integral. So you could form the integral um, using those uh, the formula we derived earlier that it's exponentially distributed, and that's exactly what I do before. And I want to emphasize again. And so this will be the the, um, uh, the third time I've mentioned it. The average amount of time you spend in the stock will be one over this chance per time, unit time of leaving. So the average amount of time that they'll spend here will be five months because it'll be 1 over 0.2, okay? So, so here we have the choice of specifying it either way, and that trance reflects the fact that the average amount of time you spend within the stock is 1 over the chance per unit time of leaving the stock. So you can specify the flow as, as the stock times some chance of leaving per some unit time, say per month, or as stock divided by the mean time before leaving. Um, uh, either way you can. And you'll again see this kind of uh, exponential decay uh, uh, in that. And so if you had a system like this, the number of people with virulent infections, if there's no inflows here, only outflows, this will be declining, will be declining fast early on. Why is it declining fast here? Why is this going down more quickly early on? and only slowly later. Why is this declining fast and then slow? This is the number of people with virulent infection. Yeah, yeah. There's more people at risk here, so there's more people who could be dying per month. Why is it going slowly here? 
fewer people at risk, so those are fewer people going to be dying per month. Given that you survived all this time, your chance of dying per month is still the same. Still have a twenty percent chance of dying per month, but there's just fewer people at risk, and so it's not declining as fast. The number of people who are still alive like that is, is not declining as fast. And some of the flow rate of deaths, the number of deaths that are occurring per month is going down in, in the same sort of way. Now the cumulative deaths will be rising quickly because early on there's a lot of people at risk, a lot of people dying, and therefore will rise quickly, but then it will plateau. And ultimately, if we followed this out, followed it over to my office there, this would go up to the level of the total population, the number of people who started here. That makes sense. Um, okay. Um, right. Uh, okay. So. Okay. Yeah. This this might be something to, to emphasize uh, a little bit. So so I'd like you like to ask here. Um, how many people die? This this is going to stretch you folks a little bit. Maybe you're stretched out for the day, but I'm going to stretch you one last time. Um, okay. So there are a thousand people at risk here. And they have a chance of 20% of leaving, of dying per month. How many people die in the first month? Okay, so 1,000 people at risk, 0.2, not a 0.02. Okay, and so how many people die in the first month? Roughly 200, 0.2 times, uh, times 1,000. Now, why roughly? Okay, okay, there is the average side, but it actually is performing that, that calculation. But what we'll actually find is in the first month, somewhat fewer than 200 people. This is actually totally deterministic. This, these system dynamic models are totally deterministic. So it's actually having exactly that number. But it is fewer than 200. Why is it fewer than 200? Let me ask this. Were there 200, were there 1,000 people at risk all the way through that first month? No, you're losing people. So you might think it should be 200 over the course of that, um, that first month. After all, you'd think, okay, there's 1,000 people at risk and 20% chance per month leaving, but, but, and so, you know, on a per month basis, you'd think there should be 200, but that 1,000 only applied really at the very beginning. By the time you're halfway through the month, oh, you know, 100 people have already died, roughly. Is so, if the time stamp were a month, yeah, the time stamp were a month, you'd see this. Uh, yeah, and it's just that, yes, if generally speaking, with these models. You can do it with, with integer time steps of like one month time step and so on. And some people do that. Generally speaking, we like it to be close to the continuous situation because people are at risk all through it. And so, so we'd like to make a time step small enough that it's very, very close to the continuous solution. Well, yeah, for your understanding, absolutely. Sense, yeah, yeah that, that's right. Um, so, um, so if you had a, uh, 50% months per risk of, of death, you would also see a, a, you know, a, a gap of, of how many um, there. And so the gap is present because 1,000 people are, you know, not, not all 1,000 people are at risk for a full month, right? Um, uh, so the value of the stock is declining over the first month. The rate of death indicates 20% of the population will die per month. Well, we may have been expecting 200 people to die. This erroneously assumes all 1,000 were at risk the entire month. In fact, because the stock is declining, there are considerably fewer people at risk, you know, during the later parts of that month. We are meaning we had fewer fewer deaths. So if we had maintained a thousand people in the stock for the first month, if immigrants have been coming in and refreshing it, then we would have had a full full two hundred, right? Um, so um, yeah, if, if we had um, uh, if we had this sort of uh, situation, um, well, okay, so. So now let's let's finish this up by by putting some pieces together. So if, if we we have, we've been thus far talked about first order delays, just this sort of part of the equation. But let's suppose we were to have immigration in here. Um, okay. Suppose first 
that we use a value of zero for the immigration rate. Now we have a classic system like we've just seen, number of people, and if this is a thousand initially, what do we expect to see? If this is a thousand and we have an annual risk of death of 0.05, what sort of curve will we see coming out of this? What will be the shape of that curve? This is basically the same situation we've been talking about for the last half hour. So some number of people, it's a chance per unit time of leaving times that number of people. So what's it, what would it look like? Yeah, it would look it, it would look something like that, right? Um, okay, um, and what's the mean time until they die? If this is, suppose now we're measuring time in, in years, apologies for going back and forth, suppose it's years now, it's 5% chance per death per year. What's your mean lifetime of people? 20. 20 years, that's right, exactly. Um, so here it's, it's, it's 20 years, okay? And the stock would go down like this. So. So now let's suppose we have immigration coming in. Suppose we have um, 100 people per month coming in. I'm oh, sorry, 100 people per year coming in. What is, what is this stock going to do? Well, we could, let's, go, let's go, go out with a bang. Let's go over to our model. Let's, let's just do this, right? Here we go. Here we have a an incidence rate of a 0.02. Um, let's let's go put an immigration in. So so uh, immigration of people without diabetes. Okay, mm -hmm. and let's make that immigration be um, a rate of 100. Okay, and then people without diabetes. It just clicks to make sure. Okay, has it got the formula right? Yeah, it considered immigration people without diabetes and the, the two old ones, the deaths of people with and incident cases, yes, that's right. So it's, we didn't have to change anything in it. We just had to verify by that. So uh, folks, I just added this. I, and how did I do that? Well, um, uh, all I did is I, I, I clicked over, so I went into this mode with flow. I clicked here and then I clicked here and I typed immigration of people with diabetes. So what do you think this stock will do now? Before it was being exhausted, because no one was coming in, people were dying off, they were dying off faster earlier because there were more people at risk and dying off. What do you think the stock will do now? Okay, we have a diabetes, annual diabetes incidence, whoops, or sorry, a, a per month incidence of, of 2%, which is quite horrendous. Um, and we have 100 people coming in per, or per month, right? Um, 100, is that right? Um, uh, 100 per month. So what is this going to do now? Okay. Okay. In what way will it increase? Will it increase faster and faster and faster? Will it, will it increase linearly? Will it oscillate? What sort of feedback is associated with this? Where's the feedback here? I spy feedback. Where, where is the feedback? Remember, feedbacks don't always stare. I mean, sometimes they stare you like this. Remember that? <laughs> Maybe you don't, but I do. Uh, remember that? Um, so where's the feedback here? It's staring me in the eye. Feedback is going here, and then where's the other piece of it? Close the circle, folks. Where's the other piece of the feedback? Does, does this thing affect that? Yes, there's actually a feedback going back from this guy to that in, in that form. So if you, what sort of feedback is it? It's a negative feedback. It's, it's a stabilizing feedback. The more people with diabetes, the higher the incident case of diabetes, which tends to deplete the, more, you know, the people without diabetes. So it acts to push back against it. So there's a negative feedback. And before, that negative feedback led it to decline here. Now, if we have an inflow, that feedback is still there. So it's still going to be stable. It's going to approach something in a gradual way. What shall it approach? What value will this approach? It's going to approach something in a stable way where inflow equals outflow. What, what value will, will it approach? What, what, what value will there be for people without diabetes? 
If it approaches something and it reaches some stasis, some homeostasis, some, some situation of stability where it's not changing anymore, under what conditions would people without diabetes not be changing anymore, ladies and gentlemen? It won't change anymore if what equals what? Inflow equals outflow. Okay, so let us, let us compute. Okay, so what is the inflow here? Immigration. What are the outflows? Well, really, deaths of people without diabetes is zero, so we're just going to put that aside. Um, but it's instant case of diabetes, right? So under what conditions would instant case of diabetes equal immigration of people without diabetes? Okay, immigration of people without diabetes is 100, so this guy equals 100, which means what must equal 100? What, what formula must equal 100? If, if this outflow is, is, is equal to 100, is equal to the inflow, which is 100, what formula must equal 100? Yeah, and, and that formula is given here. Diabetes incidence rate times people with diabetes. So what does that tell us about the value of people with diabetes? What value will it be? Diabetes incidence rate is 2%. So people without diabetes times 2% has to equal 100, right? Right? Okay, so what value would that be? Oops, let's, let's do with immigration. Yeah? Okay. So it's, it's going to be 100 divided by 2%, right? It's 100 times 50, right? Which is going to be 5,000. So let's, ladies and gentlemen, let us compute. Um, there we go. And it goes up, and it goes up to 5,000. This is the result of the negative feedback being in place. There's some immigration in, but it goes up and it reaches that value. It, st it stays at that value. And of course, that affects things down the road. That affects, affects the number of people with diabetes, which also has negative feedback associated with that. So it's going to go up and reach 10,000. Mm -hmm. um, and that's dictated by a balance of how many people are dying and number of people coming in. So that is an example of a, of a little model exhibiting first order delays, these sort of stasis, and you know, stock and flow reasoning with inflow equal outflow. Why is this, why, ladies and gentlemen, it's the final question, why is this 10,000? Why, why is this reaching 10,000? Where did that come from? Riddle me that. Okay. Well, okay, okay, so that's, that's, that's a, actually quite a, quite a deep insight, that. Um, so here, the incident cases of diabetes, we know from before, if this stock is in balance, this has to equal that, right? This is a, is 100, so in balance, this guy has to be 100, right? And, and for this one to be in balance, what has to equal 100 also? The deaths, right? The deaths have to equal 100. And for the deaths to equal 100, this guy here, it's people with diabetes times the diabetic mortality rate has to equal 100, right? And the diabetic mortality rate here is, is 0.01, right? And so 10,000 times 0.01 is equal to, to 100. So it's going to go up to, to that level as well. So here we see a cascaded series of first order delays. And they have flows into them. And as a, with a negative feedback loop, they gravitate naturally to a stability, to a balanced situation. Um, and they approach it gradually. But in that balance, the stable situation, the outflows equals the inflows. And we have this approach to this, um, um, to this asymptotic sort of uh, limit, where, or where we have the inflows kind of, and, and the flows along these different parts of the chain in balance. Okay. Um, now the situation if we had deaths with people without diabetes, if we had a non-zero chance of death, that would affect things a little bit. It would bring this down, but it would again stabilize, and this would stabilize at a different level. But um, this allows us to give um, you one final thing I'll just show here. Um, 
in, in my uh, version of this, there's this uh, mode called Synthesim, and I think it's in yours as well. I'm almost certain it is. But basically, you can adjust these, um, these assumptions. So you can adjust these around and sort of see what it yields in terms of the outcomes um, uh, with different assumptions concerning these variables. Um, so if we increase the amount of immigration, it will sort of adjust the, the dynamics. Um, uh, you know, it will adjust the, um, the simulation to reflect that, and the dynamics will be changed accordingly. So that allows us to kind of do a, um, an exploratory um, investigation of model dynamics. Okay, um, so those are first order delays. Um, and suffice it to say, with different uh, delays associated with it or different chance per unit time, um, you, can have, um, you can have different rates of, of, of change associated with it. Uh, the faster your rate of change, um, the faster it will approach its ultimate equilibrium. Okay, so uh, the faster um, the faster the time uh, in, in terms of the delays, we think of the delay as one over the chance per unit time of leaving. Um, so if you have a chance per unit time of leaving of uh, that's very very quick, um, uh, excuse me, that's very high. You'll have a very brief delay, very brief average time spent in that stock, and it will quickly approach an equilibrium. On the other hand, if you have a very long, a very low chance of leaving per unit time, it'll take a while to adjust um, to the new inflow. Um, so, uh, so basically, it, it has to do with different levels of delay within the system. So we can think of these as first order delays if we think of this, the delay is being one over this rate. Okay, so that's all for uh, today. Um, and as normal, I'll, I'll uh, post these slides and the um, and the recordings uh, in case you're interested in going through it more. But next time, we're going to see just a little bit about uh, aging chains, how we represent aging within this when things are not memoryless, and we will go and. Um, uh, and uh, take a look at uh, one or two additional aspects of system dynamics. So thanks very much. Um, oh, uh, thanks, thanks very much. Um, is, is there a question here from the remote folks? Okay, okay. Um, okay, thanks, and uh, I will um, now be signing off.